Arthur Eddington and Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Eddington, born in 1882, was the most distinguished British astronomer of his generation. From humble beginnings, his talent blossomed at university. He then worked at the Greenwich Observatory as chief assistant to the Astronomer Royal. But in his early 30s, he moved to Cambridge as professor of astronomy and observatory director. He was a leading champion of Einstein's then new theories. Famously, he was involved in the expeditions to West Africa and South America to detect the predicted bending of starlight by the sun during the 1919 total eclipse. The data seemed to confirm Einstein's predictions. Coming soon after the end of the First World War, this confirmation by Brits of a German theory attracted wide attention, especially when it was announced at a celebrated Royal Society meeting at Burlington House. It gained huge publicity. Headlines in the New York Times said, stars all awry in the heavens, men of science all agog, Newton overthrown. Edison's other interest was stars. What's their structure and what keeps them shining? He began this in the 1920s before quantum theory or nuclear energy were fully understood. So his ideas were speculative, but they were genuinely insightful. And he was also a fine popularizer and interested in philosophy. It was in the early 1930s when Eddington was around 50 years old and at the peak of his celebrity that he encountered the then young Chandrasekhar. Others may say more about Chandra's precocious childhood, but a key event was his decision to study in Europe for a PhD. After he graduated with a PhD in 1933, he was awarded a special four-year fellowship at Trinity College, Cambridge. Eddington actually lived at the Cambridge Observatory, but as a bachelor, he spent a lot of time in Trinity College. So it was at this time, in the mid-1930s, that the young Chandra and the peak career Eddington interacted closely. Chandra then moved to Chicago University, where he remained based for the whole of his long life. I first met Chandra around 1970, when I was a young postdoc and he was 60. I still remember the occasion. It was at a summer school held at Verena on Lake Como. I turned up late when most participants were away on an excursion. But not all. Standing silently in the middle of a formal garden, impeccably dressed in dark suit and white shirt, reading a novel by Thomas Hardy, was an austere looking Indian. This was Chandra. Chandra was an intimidating but always courteous figure. He had the ability to do very detailed algebra which would have intimidated younger people without making mistakes. This was amazingly impressive. One equation in his book on black holes fills three pages. I remember him giving a talk about this when he talked about these big equations and the results and he said, you may think I have used a hammer to crack eggs, but I have cracked eggs. He wrote neatly, his manuscript used different coloured inks for the different parts of the maths. And over his long career, he tackled a succession of different themes within astrophysics. For each phase of his career, he wrote maybe 20 papers and then codified them in a fat monograph, 
before moving on to a different subject. He took up general relativity, which was a theme of the Verena school, when already in his 50s, aiming to deploy his distinctive skills to do things differently from the young people's approach and hoping to reveal new insights. Chandra was fastidious and cultured. Some of us made vain efforts to persuade him to settle here in his later years, but he stayed loyal to Chicago University, where he'd been since 1936. He said that the only reason he might consider a move to England was through concern at leaving his wife, Lalitha, in the harsh environment of Chicago. My last meeting with him, a few months before he died at 85, was when he came to Oxford to check the proofs of his final book, An Analysis of Newton's Principia from a Modern Perspective. And I spoke at a meeting in Chicago in 2010 to mark his centenary. And Lalitha, who lived to be 102, was still living there. When Chandra was asked, do old scientists do more harm than good? He replied, no, but they must stick to what they're good at and not criticize younger people. And he fulfilled that maxim inspirationally. But what about Eddington? Eddington only lived to be 61, but in his later years, he certainly did not follow Chandra's maxim. He overreached himself by developing a so-called fundamental theory, which he thought unified all natural forces and even predicted the number of atoms in the universe. That number was incidentally 136 multiplied by 2 to the power 256. This stuff found little resonance with colleagues, who in the 1930s were, of course, exploring the hugely fruitful consequences of quantum theory. And when Eddington, who had been a really great lecturer, gave a bewildering talk on this theory at a Dutch university, a student in the audience asked his professor, do scientists all go that way when they get old? The professor responded, no, you've got to be a genius to go that way. The rest of us just get dumber and dumber. Whether that's comforting or not for the rest of us, I don't know. Both these men left lasting scientific legacies and many books. But it's ironical that Shando is remembered more for ideas that gelled on his first voyage to England as a 20-year-old than for the huge pile of books and papers produced over the next 65 years.